We don't become saved and we're instantly sanctified and we're instantly perfect and all our struggles go away. And it's just the fact that becoming a Christian gives us the power to combat sin, but it doesn't make us sinless. Mm, yeah. And it gives us it gives us power and sin's no longer our master, but sin is still powerful. Thanks for listening to If That Makes Sense, a family life original podcast about what life is really like following Jesus. My name's Tim. I'm in Family Life's radio department. My name is Tately, and I'm in the events department. And my name's Mike. I'm in the performing arts and events departments. We're talking about Romans 7 today. If you've been listening, you know we're going through the book of Romans. And if this is your first episode, welcome. No need to go back to the other ones just yet. You can catch up on them whenever you like. Each episode is a kind of a conversation that tries to stand on its own and just look at what the Word of God is saying and how it applies to today, our lives today. Because, yeah, it's old, but it's completely relevant to really everybody at all times. So we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 7 today. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. I don't know about you guys, 
But the second half of this chapter, starting in verse 14, Hmm. is so encouraging to me. Hmm. I became a Christian at a very young age, but I didn't really start reading my Bible until much later, like not till I was in college. So I knew the Bible stories, but I didn't know all of the 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 I guess theological meat that that's packed in there, like things like this, Paul's teaching. So around that time in college, you know, I think Satan really knows what the things are that that get to us, what what the struggles are, what the what the burdens are that that will really trip us up. And so I found myself in this cycle of repeatedly doing the same thing over and over and over again. And I knew it was wrong. And I remember prayers to God saying things like, God, I don't understand what I'm doing. I know that this is wrong, but I feel like I have no control. I feel Mm. like I can't stop doing this. Mm. And I hate it and love it at the same time. I, I despise it, but I keep going back. Sometime after that, hmm. I discovered this passage where where Paul, this hero of the faith, is saying, I do not understand what I do. Oh my gosh, that sounds just like what I was saying to God. <laughs> what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And so like this inner conflict that Paul was experiencing, it was the hugest encouragement to me to to, I guess, see for myself oh, I'm not the only one who, after becoming a Christian, still struggles and and still has sin that they need to deal with. I'm not the only person. And then finally, we get down to verse 25. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's just the hugest encouragement for me. I like that you brought up that section because that's always a section I've kind of just wrestled with what the true meaning of it is. Like, okay, we have Christ in us now, so are we still a slave to sin? No, so then why do we still sin And just that whole kind of concept? And I've actually heard it preached two different ways. I've heard people preach it as, oh, this section is before Paul became a Christian. And I've heard it preached, oh, no, it's it's what happens after we become a Christian. Yeah. So I was researching this yesterday, trying to figure out like, okay, well, what do I feel like it means? And this is when it's mm-hmm. like, we're not Bible scholars. I'm just personally trying <laughs> to suss it out for myself. And I I found someone that kind of took the Greek words and said it's in present tense and everything. Mm. And I was like, okay, to me, it really seems like it is current. And like you said, like that's encouraging. We don't become saved and we're instantly sanctified and we're instantly perfect and all our struggles go away. And it's just the fact that becoming a Christian gives us the power to combat sin, but it doesn't make us sinless. Mm, yeah. And it gives us it gives us power and sin's no longer our master. But sin is still powerful, right? And it's still there, and so it's just kind of knowing that is encouraging to be like, okay, I I still am going to struggle with this, but I do have the power now to overcome it because Christ is in me. Sometimes this is referred to as one of the most controversial mm-hmm. sections of Scripture, right? Which I had no idea, <laughs> but yeah. but the reason is. Who is this man who's being talked about? Is this the is this the believer or or before? Is this the regenerate man or the unregenerate man? When um, Paul says, "We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin," is Paul saying before I was a Christian, or mm. even now as a Christian? Right. Because like sold as a slave to sin, no, yeah. you can't you can't be. Um. So, so it was really. Really interesting reading different views and and different thoughts and yeah I was actually going to ask what what your your thoughts were I think I've landed somewhere and I'm I'm not a scholar I could be way off but it is super interesting because I it, that there is a controversy here mm-hmm. I like a lot of us when I've encountered this have thought about it one way I had a professor once who was the opposite way it was really interesting because he was a scholar you were just saying like we've all said hmm. here we're not scholars. He was a Bible, is a Bible scholar, and he's like, yeah, this probably doesn't refer to Paul as a Christian. Um, and in the time since I've, since I was in that class, I've looked at what other people have said, and I'm, I'm more inclined to think that it certainly applies to believers as well, and that that's 
part of what Paul's got in mind here too, something I had never seen until we, I was getting ready for this rep episode really kind of blew the lid off of the debate for me and made me just say, good, I can leave it at that. And it was from an old preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was saying, it's a controversy, it's a debate, but that misses the whole point. Paul's talking about anybody who's trying to be righteous in their own strength. If you're trying to be righteous by the law as a faithful Jew, which Paul was that, um, it's not going to work in your own strength. The law is not going to do that for you. If you're a Christian and you're trying to do your best to do what you know is righteous and good, and you're doing it in your own strength, the strength of the flesh, which you hear Paul talk about in not very flattering terms when he's talking hmm. about the flesh, that's going to leave you winding up empty, just like this in this cycle. I'm trying, but it's not working. Who is going to deliver me from this body of death, as he calls it, or um, body subject to, to death, as, as Tate Lee's version calls it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's anybody who's trying to just find justification on their own in their own good works. It's not going to be possible. And this is always going to be your experience if you're relying on yourself to get out of your sin, whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian yet. So that was helpful to me to be able to kind of put the debate to, to bed in my own head because ever since being taught it a different way, I, I've kind of wondered if I could use this verse, these verses as encouragement for myself when I do fum, stumble and, and, and fall in my own faith. And yeah, I definitely think it applies too. And it's a good reminder that the new way of the spirit, like Paul talks about, is not in just knowing the law and mm -hmm. trying to do the law your best. Absolutely, being a Christian does mean we we try to do our best, but we know that that's not where the strength ends. Um, it doesn't end with with just knowing the right answer and trying to do the best thing. So that was a helpful thing for me to realize. Oh yeah, there's a different way of looking at this so-called debate. Is just is just mm -hmm. zooming out. Yeah, I think I think we read the same article, one of the same ones, because because he he came up something that he said that I loved was. You know, it's kind of common to hear people talking about you can't you can't save yourself. You can't salvation never comes through your own strength. It's always God. And and what um, Mr. Lloyd Jones brought up was this passage still dealing with my profound inability, but not to save myself to sanctify myself. Mm -hmm. He says sanctification apart from the Spirit is impossible. And this is this is what. You'll, you'll notice that the spirit and, and Christ indwelling isn't mentioned in that section at all. This is, this is what it looks like to, to sanctify in any way except for Christ doing the work. That's really interesting. And there's some theological terms at play there. Do you want to break those out a little bit? Wow, I can try. <laughs> yeah, like he's just saying sanctify versus um, like justify. Yeah. So, so sanctification, I believe, is the process of becoming more and more like Christ. And it's not instantaneous, like salvation. That's an instant thing. There's, mm -hmm. there's a point where you are saved and boom. Yeah. You're, you're good. S sanctification is a process that happens over a long period of time and you don't fully complete it until you are in glory. A classic example mm. of somebody who is saved, but probably very little sanctified, would be the thief on the cross. The man mm. who, as mm. as he's dying, literally mm. uh, beside Jesus, and he's dying, this man is dying for an actual life of sin, whereas Jesus is dying innocently. Mm. He comes to know who Jesus is. He's like, you're innocent. I I'm a sinner. I deserve to be here. You don't. Mm. And... Jesus, in paraphrased Tim terms, tells him like, yeah, you get it. Congratulations. When you breathe your last breath, you'll be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. He's saved. Why is he saved? Because he sees who Jesus is and he accepts it. That's what salvation is. But he wasn't like sanctified. If that guy had miraculously recovered and gotten down off the cross, he might have still been tempted to, I don't know, rob banks or whatever it was mm -hmm. that got him to the cross in the first place, that thief who died beside Jesus. He hadn't had time to 
be sanctified and learn his Bible <laughs> and put to death some of those old habits in his life. But that would have followed if there was time. What happened happened in an instant and it was salvation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, terms like that a lot of times are just helpful to to have in mind. I mean, you don't need to be a Bible scholar to know them, but they do open up the book for you when you're looking at it. And yes, right. another term we see Paul using, and we'll just maybe volleyball this around amongst mm -hmm. ourselves a little bit for a second here is the flesh. Like that's, mm. he talks about the flesh a lot and it's confusing. I'll be honest. Like mm. I do say most podcasts that Romans is for everybody and it is, it's for all of us, but it doesn't mean that like, it's always easy. There mm. are things that people debate over as we've already talked about. And the flesh is one because it makes such an appearance in this chapter or the body as it's sometimes called. Um, in a lot of ways when Paul uses it, not every time, but a lot of times he's referring to the sin nature. And that's something I like about the version you read from Tately was that some, some places where my version says flesh, yours said sin nature. And that can help to kind of cut through some of the confusion because when he's talking about the flesh, he's not saying that the body, the physical body, flesh and blood is a bad thing. We believe as Christians, mm -hmm. like God created bodies as a good thing. but there's this idea that sin and our sin nature is part of who we are as fallen creatures, as fallen part of this creation. And that's the part of us, not the literal flesh of skin and bone, but when Paul's talking about the flesh, it's the part of us that is still going to be bound to that sin nature as long as we're <laughs> still here on this earth. But yeah, he talks a lot about flesh and about how uh, sin springs to life at the law. That was interesting how your version put that, Tately, that, that when the law came, uh, I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin sprang to life. So just interesting things there about <laughs> how sin and the flesh, that's part of us, even though it doesn't define who we are anymore in Christ. Yeah, I actually underlined that along with the part right before it. This kind of parallels it because it says, for apart from the law, sin was dead. And then right after this, it springs, sin sprang to life. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, so with no law, sin's dead. With life, like, and it was just really interesting to me because I, I actually like was like, what does this mean? Yeah. This is, this mm -hmm. is odd. This is an odd parallel. And even like sin seizing opportunity and everything, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it was just very interesting. Um, and so I tried to kind of just like dig into it and kind of his example of coveting, like coveting is wrong because God said so. Mm. He said, don't covet. Now there's something you can do, which is coveting. So now there's sin. Mm. And it's kind of just that weird thing of until God says not to do this, there's no opposite, which is yeah. the sin of doing it. Mm. Um, and it's just kind of like this weird thing that happens. And then it almost seems unfair. Like, well, then why did God make commandments? Because he's just giving people a right to sin. And, and mm -hmm. I don't even I didn't even really get to an answer there. It was just I kept digging deeper and deeper. And it was just interesting because it's like we know it's just because in the previous chapter, Paul's talking about how we died to sin and we're alive in Christ and, and like the gospel. And now in this chapter, he's explaining, OK, but how does that make sense in a legal and just standpoint? And he's mm. breaking down the legal terms and how a just God can allow this to happen and how a just God rectified us to himself through his own rules. And it's just interesting. It's kind of like, I don't want to touch a random button until I'm told, don't touch that button. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to touch it because I was told not to. And that's exactly what's happening here. Yeah. And I kind of came to this point where I'm like, okay, even without law, you sin. We, we were born into a sin nature. We just do it in ignorance. Mm. But knowledge brings about awareness of sin and awareness brings about our willingness to participate in it, mm. mm. which is worse. Yeah. And so that is, you know, then sin is springing to life in us because yeah. we are knowingly choosing it. Mm. Exactly to that. He says in verse 13, that because he's asking like is is something that's good the law is it is, is the law bad then it's a good thing but did a good thing bring death to me by no means it was sin producing death in me through that which is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment 
might become sinful beyond measure. How did your verse version put that at the end instead of beyond measure? That sin might become utterly sinful. Utterly sinful. Hmm. So it's like, it's already wrong mm-hmm. to steal, to covet. It's already wrong, but like you just kind of know it's wrong. It becomes sinful beyond measure when you know it's wrong and then God gives an explicit command not to do it. And, and, and then in ourselves, there's a number of ways where that law will lead to more death, so to speak, for us. In one sense, it's because not only are we doing something wrong, we're doing something wrong that we know not to do wrong. It's become sinful beyond measure because it's a bad thing that God also told you not to do. So you shouldn't have done it and you knew not to do it. Also, I think the other sneaky way that sin seizes an opportunity through the law, like Paul's talking about through this this whole chapter, is because even when we know the right thing to do and then try to do it, so often I think we're doing it in the wrong way or with the wrong heart. Hmm. We can be trying to be righteous um, in our own st- – it's good to try to be righteous, but we can try to be better than. We can try mm-hmm. to – we can we can inflate ourselves with pride because we follow these rules and we know more than other people and we are good scholars of God's law. You know, we can let knowing these things actually produce more death in us if the knowledge doesn't lead to a simple, trusting, obedient love of Christ. If it leads to anything else, an inflated opinion of ourself, a downgraded opinion of other people, there are all these ways that the law makes sin in us when we hold it up as the ultimate thing. Again, like Paul says, the law is good, but when you try to do the relationship thing with God only by the law and your own strength, this is what you get. You get a cycle of death going on. first part of that you were saying about you know how we can try to follow the law too much and, and law taking advantage I kind of looked at that too of um, what's it mean when sin can take advantage of the law more so than just our willingness to participate and I actually wrote down I said you know when sin meets the law we can have two responses the first response it can take advantage of is okay I can never follow all those rules so why would I try hmm. and why would I care But the second response actually kind of goes into then what Paul says about, I don't understand what I do. And that is, oh, I can keep all these laws and I can focus on being good Hmm. and I can focus on being righteous. And both of those are equally as deceitful and it's equally sin taking advantage of the law. And I think that's that's why it's Hmm. really interesting just to look at the order in which Paul even wrote because he writes this and he's like, okay, here's the way sin can take advantage. And then he goes into... I absolutely cannot do it mm. without Christ. Mm, that's good. And that makes me think of why it's interesting that he chose the 10th commandment, do mm. not covet. The first nine commandments, you can tell yourself that you've always kept them. Mm. You can say, I've never carved an idol. Mm. Uh, I've always honored in public my my mother and father. Mm -hmm. I've never worshipped another god like I only have Yahweh. You know, we're speaking from the perspective of somebody who's in Paul's circumstances, a Jew in the first century. You know, go through the laws. I've never stolen. uh, I've never killed anybody. So you could go through all nine commandments and say, never done one, never broken one of them. But then you get to 10. 10 is the only one from this perspective, as far as they knew, that it, it... your heart is the only place where that happens and only you see it. Hmm. Do not covet. Thou shalt Hmm. not covet. And you can tell yourself you've never had another God. You can tell yourself you've done all these other things, but when you get to 10, it's going to convict you. And so Hmm. I think that's really interesting. Hmm. Tately, you're talking about the order in which Paul wrote these things, even the commandment he he Mm -hmm. chose. He could have picked any of them, but he picks the 10th one specifically for a reason to say, this is the one that shows you no matter how good you are at following rules, you're going to break this one because you won't even try to covet. You're just going to see something somebody else has and think, oh, I wish I had that and not them. <gasps> well, there you go. Broke the, You just broke it. You just broke the 10th commandment without even trying. So I love that. Just the, the deliberate way that all of this is crafted and written to get, the, to get his message across. My mind is still blown by pushing the, the red button. 
So in scripture, it talks about how the law came to show how we couldn't fulfill the law.、Mm-hmm. And that's kind of made sense to me. I, I felt like it's never really fully 100% like,、oh, I understand this. But just the idea that you guys brought up today that when the law comes and the law says don't push that button, you automatically want to push the button, even if you didn't before. And so not only does the law show that we can't keep the law, the law shows that at some level we don't want to keep it.、Ooh. And that's something that's. A new idea for me,、mm. but it makes sense looking back on you know my own life. Not only do I do the things that are wrong, I want to,、mm. and that that's just such an interesting concept that I've never thought of before. So that's、real. I learned something really cool today. <laughs> yeah, I love how you put that.、Yeah. The law doesn't just show I can't keep it. It really, if I'm honest with myself, it shows I don't even want to on、mm-hmm. my own. Wow.、Mm. My only final thing was with it where it ends. You know, he kind of what he does all through it. He brings up this issue. It seems unsolvable. You're like, well, I must end to something either way. And then he always brings it back to God of, but God, and it's always、mm. that encouragement of he just continues to break people down to show them their need for God. And what I liked about it is when you look at all the details and all how. God is just, so He had to make it work at from a legal logistical standpoint, and it's complex and it's confusing. And we can read it and we can be like, "This is hard to understand. This is difficult because we're trying to understand God." But what's so nice about that is the gospel itself is so beautifully simple and accessible. Yes,、hmm. yes. Even even in a book that feels dense at times <laughs> theologically, we don't have to panic and say. I don't have a Bible degree, so I can't understand it. It's like no, like that's that's something I'm learning just looking at this. I don't need to be able to completely understand every single part、mm-hmm. to know that this is hopeful truth for me,、yep. and that the basic, the simple truth of the gospel is right here in this book. And so we end exactly as Paul does. <laughs> Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> that is the only answer. Thank you for joining us for If That Makes Sense, the family life podcast about what life is really like as a young adult following Jesus. If you enjoy the show, please send it to a friend. Your genuine appreciation of the show is the best way for word to get out, and it would make our day if you left us a rating and a review wherever you found this episode. Family Life has more great original podcasts that you can check out at familylife.org/podcast. Thanks again, and we look forward to having you along for the next one.